This is Jeff Petrie after uh, the Montreal Canadiens' most recent loss to the Pittsburgh Penguins. It's frustrating. It's the same things over and over. We're not playing as a team. We're not playing as a group. It's like you're searching to find where people are. It seems like there's no structure out there. Those are some pretty damning comments. We're going to get into all of those comments and so much more on the final Hockey Inside Out episode of 2021. We've done so many of these to this point, and the Canadians are where they are. Welcome to Hockey Inside Out. My name is Julian McKenzie. I am joined alongside Stu Cowan of the Montreal Gazette, Rick Green, former Montreal Canadiens assistant coach and, of course, Stanley Cup champion. I'm filling in for Jessica Rusnak, my good buddy, Andrew Berkshire. You can watch him on the Game Over podcast on the SDPN YouTube channel, and he sometimes contributes to the Montreal Gazette. I was just on your show, Andrew, and now I get to see you again. Yeah, long time no see, Julian. It's been about, uh, what, less than 12 hours? Yeah, that's actually pretty insane. We keep, we keep running into each other, and uh, I'll also get to uh, guest host uh, your show uh, during the holidays at different points as well. But let's talk about Jeff Petrie to start. I read off the quote off the intro. The big damning part of that quote, it seems like there's no structure out there. And I have to admit, with Dominic Ducharme and this structure, this system, if anyone were to come up to me and be like, hey, Julian, what is this system? I can't go out and explain it. I don't know if any of you guys are able to go out there and explain it. What did you guys think of what Jeff Petrie had to say about uh, his team's play out there during the uh, the loss to the Penguins? Jeff Petrie has hinted at this earlier this season. This isn't the first time. This is the strongest he's come out and spoke against the system. He had mentioned earlier, I would have called him a couple of weeks ago, saying that they need to find a system where the players are playing more and thinking less. And that's what Jeff Petrie said a few weeks ago, said that hesitation when you're thinking instead of reacting is causing a lot of these breakdowns in the zone. So he's obviously frustrated. Uh, he sat out four games, that upper body injury and watched from the press box and saw, got even a better view of just how discombobulated everything is on the ice. Guys don't know where they're going, what they're doing. And you got to remember too, Jeff Petrie's an assistant captain. He's a leader on this team. So you have to think he's speaking for the team when he talks like that. He's the a voice from the locker room and the players are obviously confused. They don't look like they know what they're doing on the ice. We went through this last season when Ducharme first came in and tried to put in his system, and the players really struggled trying to figure it out. They never figured it out until they were down 3-1 to the Leafs in the playoffs, and then it started to click. But, you know, Carey Price also saved their butts a lot of times during that playoff run. So this is a continuing continuing thing. As I mentioned, Petrie's spoken about it before, uh, sort of confusion on the ice. And after the game in Pittsburgh, he just said it in a louder voice. And Jeff Petrie's a very smart, very thoughtful guy. So, like, this didn't just come off the top of his head. I'm sure he went into this uh, post-game news conference knowing what he was going to say and sending a message. And I would imagine a lot of the players in the room are feeling the same way and don't have the same voice as Jeff Petrie are, are happy that he said what he did. And, and when you hear a comment like that coming out from one of your top players, uh, that's a major blow to the whole, uh, you know, coaching staff Um and what they're trying to do. And Jeff has, you know, a number of times spoken about frustration. Well, he's finally had it. He, you know, like Stu has said, he's been sitting up watching the team play for four games, and he's really seeing it from a different perspective on how badly organized and, you know, just how poorly they're playing in so many areas. And this is uh, this is going to be interesting moving forward to see how they handle this type of uh, these type of comments and when you hear it from a guy like that, it's uh, it, there's a big question as far as just, you know, what the team's all about. And somebody is going to have to obviously uh, pay for that. Uh, I don't know if it's going to uh, start the ball rolling as far as, OK, we need to make some changes uh, in the direction. There's something that's not clicking, obviously. So where do we go and who is the one to help be held accountable for trying to make changes? So. Uh, Jeff Gordon is going to have some some interesting times here as we uh, start to hear some of these grumblings come to the public. And uh, I don't think that he can let these type of things go by without uh, addressing them in, in, in one, shape, one way, shape or form. That is the big danger of a season like this, right? And we heard Jeff Gordon say that Ducharme is safe for the rest of the season, but because the Canadians are on pace to win 
eight games this season, or sorry, 16 games this season. They're winning two of every 10. It's not pretty, and it hasn't improved at all. So when that bitterness sets in and you start having guys that are, you know, going for the throat in media availabilities, it's not good. Even if it is the leaders and they're speaking for other players in the team, it's not good for the team long term. It's not good for cooperation between players. You know, Petrie is obviously frustrated. He's had a nightmare season, his worst season by far in the league. And so you can see that frustration bleed through into maybe starting to play the blame game. And not that there isn't blame to go around, but Petrie has not been himself. You look at what Ducharme's system has been in his time in Montreal. And I think during the playoffs, you could see kind of what the goal was, which was essentially to score first and then shell and rely on their big defensemen and carry price to hold them in. And when teams overcommitted to try to attack, you get to counterattack. And you had guys like Suzuki and Caulfield and Lekkinen and Byron who could attack off the rush and Toffoli, all those guys who could pile up some goals in that manner. This season, almost every game they're allowing the first goal. They don't have the opportunity to execute what they were doing in the playoffs. And they also don't have Carey Price. No disrespect to Jake Allen, who I think has been great. But without those pillars and without a guy like Shea Weber as well to add to that top four, without Joel Edmondson, they haven't been able to play shutdown hockey and they haven't been able to get leads either. So everything that was working and making them successful during the playoffs, they haven't even had a chance to try. And and Petrie's been around bad teams before. I mean, he was in Edmonton, never made the playoffs during his time at Edmonton. So he's seen this horror show before. One of the reasons he re-signed with the Canadians when he was a free agent is because he got his first taste of the playoffs at the Bell Center, and he loved it, and he wanted more of it. You know, you have to figure Petrie's one of the guys that Jeff Gordon will be trying to move as part of the rebuild, and Maybe another reason Petrie spoke the way he did after the Pittsburgh game is that he wants out, which wouldn't be surprising at all. Uh, As far as with Ducharme, though, you know, Jeff Gorton said that he's here till the end of the season. And I believe that's something Jeff Molson told Jeff Gorton is I'm not paying for a third head coach this season. He's already paying Claude Julien $5 million. He's paying uh, Ducharme $1.7 million. But now, like, what do you do? Like an easy fix would be to make Luke Richardson the interim head coach. But then there's a whole new language controversy is going to pop up. Remember Randy Cunningworth. So I'm sure Molson doesn't want that. So I don't know where they go and what they do, but this can't continue. There's a lot of games left in this season. And if you have veterans speaking out like this, it's a, it's a bad attitude. It's a losing attitude in the room. The young guys are going to be infected by this. You look at what happened in Buffalo, uh, and the Canadians are looking like a similar situation. right? Now. This is a real, real mess right now. And is there that, anything other than ego that would prevent them from bringing back Claude Julian since he's still under contract and just say, can you finish out the season for us? Yeah, I don't think you can. I don't think you can do that. That's I don't think that's Claude wouldn't want to come back. I mean, Claude's looking ahead. He's already doing that Team Canada thing for the Spangler Cup. And if the NHL doesn't go to the Olympics, he'll be coaching Team Canada at the Olympics. And I would imagine Claude's looking. Uh, it's nice to see that Claude wants to get back into coaching. It's good to see him back, but he's not going to come back to Montreal. He's got, And Jeff Molson wouldn't do that either. But like, what does he do? Do you just continue with this coach? Um, no, I understand money is one thing. And you also want the new GM who's going to come in eventually to hire the new coach or have a say in the new coach. But what do you do until then? I mean, I, it's, I mean, that locker room has just got to be, a, it's just got to be infected right now with negative. And, and, and as I said, you know, Jeff Petrie, I, I think, spoke for a lot of players in that room with his comments. And I think you really have to understand that all good teams that have success at the NHL level do a great job starting in the defensive zone first. And when I say that, I'm I'm talking about one-on-one battles and I'm talking about structure as far as everybody knows what their job is and they execute it to max. But I look at them now uh, running around all over in the defensive zone. I don't know whether... They, they're playing like man on man, but it just seems mass confusion. And uh, that, that ends up uh, with a problem with obviously their transition game because they're always chasing. They're always on the wrong side of things. And until they can correct that, and I don't see it happening with the structure that they have in place right now uh, in seeing any improvement that's going to allow them to be better offensively and get the puck going up the ice uh, with a better transition game. So, I, I look at their defensive zone play as a disaster, uh, and uh, you can blame somebody on 
structure. You can also blame it on some of the personnel. But right now, I think there's mass confusion as far as what the job responsibilities are for each and every guy that's on the ice in the defensive zone. And you're not going to win any hockey games when you have mass confusion like what's happening there now. The other possibility, if they do decide to make a coaching change and Jeff Molson changes his mind, I wonder if there would be a thought of maybe bringing J.F. Hool up uh, on an interim basis just because half the guys in the team right now are Laval Rocket players anyway. And it would be a case of you'd avoid the language controversy and it would be clear to J.F. Hool you're just here till the end of the season and you go back to Laval. Maybe that's an option that they look at. Uh, but as I said, I just I don't see how they can continue like this for was there fifty odd games left in the season. Uh, I just I don't see how they can continue going like this. It's just it's 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 going to hurt the team not only this season. It's going to hurt the team moving forward. I think you, Rick, you know this better than me. Like you wonder if little click start forming guys who like Ducharme, guys who don't like Ducharme, or I mean, it's just a mess. But the last thing I'll just say with with this is the the biggest reason why. I wasn't surprised when Jeff Gordon said that he's going to keep Dominic Ducharme is you have to look at where this team could be in, in terms of the draft lottery prospects when it comes time in 2022. Uh, not to say that the guys in the locker room shouldn't be encouraged to try to, you know, get their spirits up by winning more games, but this is purely a tank measure. Like uh, as far as I'm concerned with the way that the team has looked up until that press conference uh, with Jeff Gordon, where he announced that Dominic Ducharme is going to stay he didn't do anything with this team this season to suggest that this team could go on some kind of a winning streak to get themselves out of whatever depths of putrid play they've been in. So the fact that he's staying, no disrespect to Dominic Ducharme, but this is purely a tank measure. This is purely a way for the Canadians to ensure that they do not go on some kind of St. Louis Blues-esque run that will have them in the conversation to make the playoffs. This is purely a measure to ensure that the Canadians stay down low in the standings and give themselves at least some chance at the number one overall pick, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I am with Stu on the fact that, you know, you don't want to get to a point where it's so bad in the locker room where there, there, there's no point of return and, and clicks start to form and it's bad for the young players there. But I think with the way that the Canadians are probably looking towards the future, I mean, no one's gone out and straight up just said, hey, this team is in a rebuild mode, but we're all kind of thinking it here. This is the way to do it. You have to go through this pain in order to see better days. If the Canes decide, you know what, we're going to try to make the playoffs again somehow this year. Not Again, this roster can't do that. Uh, that's going to create more problems for them down the road. Well, this roster, they're going to lose no matter what system they play. No matter what. right now. But at least have the players playing a system they understand or that they're comfortable playing. Like it, if you're going out on the ice with a negative attitude right from the start, you get on the ice. It's, it's, it's not good. I mean, you can lose – but still have sort of a positive environment in the room. That you got to remember, there's a lot of guys from Laval who are just happy to be in the NHL right now. You know, uh, Mike Pozzetta, guys like that, uh, Dauphin, they never dreamed they'd be playing in the NHL. They're waking up every day happy to be in the NHL and then going into this negative environment. So there's nothing positive about losing, but you can certainly make the environment less negative, I think, moving forward. Well, you got you got to uh, give Bruce, or Bruce uh, Boudreaux full credit for pushing the right buttons in Vancouver to date. Bruce, mm -hmm. there it is. Andrew, do you want last word on this topic before we move on to our next question? Yeah, sure. I think it's all good to you know, facilitate the tank. I think that's something the Canadians need to do both this year and next year. But if it gets to the point where things are falling apart like they are now, I think you've got to, even if it's not about systems, you've just got to have guys playing with pride a little bit. And you're going to lose anyway, like Stu said, with this roster. You've got to have guys who are playing with pride, who want to make an impact. And I think you see that with some of the young kids, uh, less so with some of the veterans. But the deflating quintupling of losses, like it's just it compounds over a season, you know. And I think even those young guys, if this doesn't get even a little bit better over time, the happy to be here attitude goes out the window and it just becomes a hard thing to do. And it's less about, you know, living your dream in the NHL and becomes just a job. Can I, just, can I just add that, that, that right. my experience, I'm sorry, just my experience in Washington with losing years, uh, you know, the players begin to accept losing and it's a really bad, bad situation that they think they're working hard. They think that they're, they're getting involved in paying the price, but they are not. So it's a, it's really a, it's, it's not a really a good environment to, to have this type of stuff uh, going on, especially when you've got some young guys that are trying to figure out how to play in the NHL.
Rick, hold that thought on on your experiences with the Washington Capitals because that's going to come in handy a little later on in the show. Uh, I do want to talk about Jonathan Drouin, who has actually been one of the few bright spots for the Montreal Canadiens this year. Uh, gets himself a goal and an assist against the Pittsburgh Penguins on Tuesday night. What are your thoughts on on his play uh, for pretty much most of this season with the Montreal Canadiens as long as he's been in the lineup? Well, he he, show, he showed up obviously last night. It's like wow, look at look at this guy just decided to play. But you know, if you look, uh, you know, he's he's third in scoring. Give him give him his marks for that. But uh, sometimes you know it's hard to find him, and sometimes you get discouraged to see him uh, playing all you know uninterested. I see him sometimes, and not just him, but a number of guys. They go to the bench like it's like no big rush. They're just like lally uh over to the bench, and I'm going like get over to the bench so you can get the change done. But anyway, Jonathan Drouin, you know, as we have seen in previous years, uh, he's capable of playing. But I think that his consistency has always been a knock, and I don't uh, I don't know whether or not you're going to get uh, that type of game and result like he did versus Pittsburgh. Uh, for the rest of the uh, year. So my, my big concern with this type of uh, player is, uh, you know, does he show up? Does he really want to pay the price each and every night? And that's not exactly what, what you need uh, from one of your supposedly top offensive players. Yeah, my, my thing with Jonathan Druin is I look at the games that he's been excellent this year, and I've just been disappointed with his teammates. You know, you look at the first couple games of the year where he was the guy who was carrying the bag and scoring goals, scored the first goal of the year. And you expect that after the story of what he went through over the last couple of seasons and sitting out last year during the playoffs, that Jonathan Druin scoring the first goal of the season, like the rest of the team would be ready to like skate right through the boards to get the next one. And it was just this like flop, like nothing really happened. So as much as Jonathan Druin struggles with consistency at times, and he is a flawed player. He's not a good defensive player, although he's improved in that area. His offensive game at even strength has improved as well. So I look at the lack of consistency of Druin is definitely an issue, but he's a middle six winger and he does that job well. He's paid relatively appropriately. I think that if anything, he's increased his trade value this year, but I've just been disappointed with his teammates not keying off his good play and I think he should be one of the more inspiring stories on this Canadian team. And the fact that he's been that even inconsistently and his teammates haven't rallied around it is just supremely disappointing to me. <clears throat> Rick, it's interesting. You mentioned that about guys dogging it, sort of going back to the bench, just sort of cruising in. I've noticed that a lot this season, especially at games at the bell center, when you're watching from the press box, you notice that guys just aren't skating hard when they're going back to the bench and it's hard to understand. And it's, Drouin's done it. Nick Suzuki does it. A lot of the guys do it. And you wonder, like, that's, that's, that's bad. It's like it seems to be an infectious type of thing. And the, the other guy on the bench is waiting to get on, waiting to get on. And it seems to be a lot of – and a lot of the – like, Nick Suzuki's got an A on his sweater. Drouin is a leader. Like, you know, if the, the young guys are watching the leaders sort of doing that, it's sort of like, – you wonder if it rubs off. I mean, that's interesting you notice that because I've noticed that also. And, you know, Jonathan Drouin is who he is, right? I mean – he looked great against Pittsburgh, and he'll probably disappear now for a couple of games, and then we'll see him again. That's just the player he is. He's he's inconsistent, and I think that's what drives fans and coaches and everybody else in the league crazy. And that's why Tampa Bay was willing to trade him. Um, so he is who he is. I mean, he you know he'll come to play one game, and he won't come to play the next game. And sometimes he looks great, and sometimes you don't even notice him on the ice. But he's not alone. There's a lot of guys in this team that have been. Has anybody seen Yoel Armia recently? No. last year last year yeah in the playoffs i mean you signed that new contract and uh you bought an invisible man suit i think with some of the money uh so there's a lot of guys on this team that you just you notice in one game and then you don't see them again and and there's too many guys on this team that are like that and as i said drawing has a has been like that his whole career uh and i think he's been around he is who he is he's been around long enough i don't think there's going to be a that's really going to change, but he's still an offensively skilled player. He needs to shoot the puck more. Uh, I don't know if he'll ever do that. He's always a pass first mentality, but uh, yeah, it's a problem. Well, there's a, there's a lot of the details of the game that should not be allowed and the players should be held accountable and they are not. And uh, you know, we can go there. I have a, a list. 
you can go down them and, uh, you know, uh, it, it just shouldn't be accepted, but it is. And uh, not, not a good situation to have your team having some lazy and some, you know, uh, some areas of their, their game that could be improved uh, and they, they don't care to, uh, to work at it. Yeah, and then the, the opposite end of that is, I mean, Brendan Gallagher hasn't been around for a while, but one of the things with Brendan Gallagher, every time he goes to the bench, he looks like he's going to die because he's left absolutely everything he has on the ice. You watch when he gets to the bench, the head's down, he's sucking to get, get the wind back and get ready to go for the next shift. There's not enough guys on this team that are doing that. Well, we've, we've, we've made the jokes all the time on this show with Rick Green. He's played on the worst uh, NHL team in, in league history, the Washington Capitals of 1975. Eight. 67 and five record it's it it sucks it very much sucks uh, the Montreal Canadiens worst season ever a 48 game season mind you but they went 10 33 and five through 30 games they have a 6 21 and three record uh, is this the worst Canadians team in franchise history are they going to end with the worst record in franchise history and I guess to kind of make it twofold and make it and had a little positive spin on this at the end. Since we know this is going to end in late April, this season of theirs, what can they focus on, uh, you know, in order to kind of make things a little bit positive? I know I'm throwing out a lot of stuff at you guys here, but uh, there's a reason why we have you on hockey inside out. Yeah, it's definitely looking like the worst season in franchise history. They're on pace for it. I think that uh, if you were to cut it at 48 games, highly likely, that it will be worse than the 1939-1940 season. But I think Carey Price, when he comes back, is going to change things a little bit, especially if the Canadians choose to keep Jake Allen in the fold as well. And having that one-two punch down the line, they'll probably steal a few more games than we expect. Like, you look at Jake Allen this season, and he's put up some fantastic performances, and then when he gets played too many games in a row... He starts to look tired. You saw it last night against the, uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins. You saw it against the St. Louis Blues a little bit. Things start to fall apart for Jake Allen. So having a real starting goaltender in the fold should help them win more games down the stretch. And bad teams usually do win more at the end of the season when like there's nothing really to play for and guys are loose and you know, they get underestimated. So probably not going to end up with a worse winning percentage than that season. But at the 48 game mark, probably worse. And Things to focus on positively, the trade deadline and the draft. It's the same thing for every tank and team. What can you accrue at the trade deadline? Unfortunately for the Canadians, they have a ton of long-term contracts. So it, it might be a situation where a lot of these guys end up sticking around and get traded next year. That's a bonus episode, by the way, coming up over the holidays. But we'll get more info on that. Stu, go ahead. I'm not only wondering when, but if Carey Price is going to come back this season. <clears throat> the NHL doesn't go to the Olympics, and I think that might be something that was maybe pushing Carey Price a bit to come back earlier uh, to show that he could still be on that Olympic team. If the NHL pulls out of the Olympics, I wonder if Carey Price just, you know, what's him coming back this season? The only reason, really good reason, would be if they're going to try and trade him in the offseason and move that contract and show that he can still play again. But to me, at that point, it's better just let him take the season off and, and make sure his knee's 100% and whatever other issues he was dealing with that ended him up in the player assistance program and start fresh next season and 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 go from there. So I, like, I'm like i wondering at this point if we're even going to see Carey Price later uh, on this season. As far as if this is going to be the worst Canadians team ever, I think definitely because you know March 21st, I believe, is a trade deadline. They're going to be moving some of their key players before then, so they're going to get worse. They're not going to get better. Uh, we're going to have more AHL-caliber guys playing up with the Canadians, and uh, this is going to be this is. I mean, as bad as it is now, I think it's going to get even worse. You know, you take if they let's say they trade Petrie, and let's say they trade Gallagher, uh, and let's say Price doesn't. This is like going to be an even worse hockey team than than it is right now. So this is going to be long and painful. As far as what the focus on moving forward, I think they need to focus on player development. If they're going to be playing all these sort of AHL type guys, uh, take the pressure off of winning and just focus on player development. Uh, let Jeff Gorton see what he has moving forward, uh, both for in Laval and with the Canadians. Who, who? The thing with this season, not enough guys are wearing that sweater with pride, and I think that's what led to that fan throwing his sweater on the ice. It's one thing to lose; it's another thing to go through the motions. Find out who's who wears that sweater with pride. Who who doesn't accept losing? Who gets pissed off when they lose a game? Who like who who has a, the desire? 
to really make this team better moving forward because it's going to be painful moving forward. You can lose, but lose with with pride and lose with dignity and and work as hard as you can every shift. So I think moving forward, they got to find out who those players are. Who are the guys that are going to be like that? And not only in, in, with the Canadians, but with Laval also. You know, you want to have a strong farm team coming up because you're going to have a lot of prospects coming through. Who are the veteran guys that are going to set a good example for the younger guys moving forward? So for me, that's the focus for the rest of the season. And as Andrew said, obviously the trade deadline and and the draft. I mean, that's the only the draft is the only thing really that Habs fans can be excited about at this point. And really, I think they're going to need more than Carey Price if he does come back and is healthy um, with the group that they have. And, you know, Stu, you touched on pride. I, I just I don't understand uh, from what I see why guys are not thrilled at the opportunity to be part of the Montreal Canadian story franchise. They surely do not play like that or they're just not capable of doing it or combination. But listen. Each, each and every one of those guys that they have currently on their roster uh, obviously are, are not playing up to their capabilities. They are not really paying the price and doing what they uh, should be doing to try and make a difference in, you know, uh, making things better uh, for, for the Montreal Canadiens. And, uh, you know, moving forward here uh, as far as, yeah, they're, they're going to, I don't know whether they break the franchise record for losses, uh, I don't know if it's going to get that bad, but I mean, looking at the players uh, that they currently have, uh, I think that they obviously have to do some some serious uh, change of personnel. And every each and every one of those guys that's on the roster right now, name should be mentioned because uh, easier said than done. You know, uh, Andrew talked about long term uh, contracts. It, it's going to be tough, but. Um, they're going to have to change their their group up because it's just not uh, it's not the type of guys that uh, are going to get the job done, and it's obvious with uh, the performance that they're uh, they're giving it to date. And, with- and that long term contract situation is is kind of the biggest worry that they have is guys that you see like the Yoel Armia contract was bad from the, st- the moment it was signed, right? You, you just don't especially when they weren't bottom- going to keep Corey Perry either because yeah, he like- looked really good because he was on that line. Exactly. And like Yoel Armia, I think is a luxury player in the NHL. He's a guy who like every 10 games will give you, he looks like Mario Lemieux out there. Right. But most of the time he's just a fourth line guy who does some things very well. You can't give that type of player a long-term contract. And that's an issue that Bergevin never realized. Like his first moves as general manager, when he came in were to sign Brandon Press and Travis Moen to long-term contracts two legitimate fourth liners, but guys that did not stick those entire contracts. Like you cannot do that in this league. It's a bad idea. He still didn't learn it. And now they're stuck. And you look at the guys that are on expiring contracts. And one of the guys that probably has the most value is Arturi Lekkinen. He's one of the guys who's consistently brought it every single game this year. Do you actually want to move him? You know, like if you had to choose between UL Armia and Arturi Lekkinen, you probably keep Lekkinen. He wants yeah. to wear that jersey, right? But they might not have that choice. Arturi Lekin must look at Yoel Army and go, oh, my God, I wish I had his size and his skill and his shot and his ability to protect the puck and his everything else because I'd score 30 goals a year and I'd be making $5 million bucks. As you know, I don't know if he'd score 30 goals. Well, if he had if he had Yoel Armia's hands and skills, he would. I mean, the thing with, with, uh, with him, he, he, he creates so many can- chances. Lekin, he, he works so hard. And he creates does. so many breakaways and so many chances, but he can't finish. So, like, if he had the skill of Armia, he would finish, though. So, it must be – I can't ima- – Armia must be one of the most frustrating players for any NHL coach to watch. I mean, there's reasons why he was a number one draft pick. I think he was 16th overall by Buffalo. He's got all the skill and the talent in the world, but he's out there for a skate. It's 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 like he, it's like a game is like a, a you know summer scrimmage uh, when the guys get together getting ready for the season. It's – it's and. Like I think we've seen enough of them already. We were talking earlier about you know Jonathan Drouin is who he is. Yoel Armia is who he is. And and as Andrew said, that contract uh, is really looking bad right now that uh, that they gave him. And he just seems to be. I hate to say it, but it seems like he got the contract and well, he's happy. And and when Dominic Ducharme right. last year spoke so highly of Armia as being one of the top guys in the league for skill, et cetera, et cetera, I'm going. Uh, 
whoops, I, I, I don't practice. It. <laughs> he was not in my, uh, he was not in my best list for guys that show up and play uh, mm -hmm. period. And uh, you know, we can, we can go down the list, but there's, there's another one that goes into the pile going, why would you sign a guy like this to that type of term with that kind of money and get nothing close to what you should be getting from a guy uh, like that, which is consistent other than the playoffs last year. If I was down with Ducharme, I'd sit your army down and I'd play him videos of Arturi Lekin in shifts for an hour and then say, why don't you do that? Why don't you work like <laughs> 70%? Just, just work 70% as hard as Arturi Lekin does. Please, like just, just try and do that and let's see what happens. Uh, 52 more games with this, everybody. 52 more games. <laughs> <laughs> Normally it's Stu who counts the amount of games left in the uh, Montreal Canadian season, but I decided to look ahead. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for filling in for Jess. Uh, Rick, Stu, thanks as always for uh, tapping into our show, of course. And uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, the uh, 2021 episodes of Hockey Inside Out have come to an end. Uh, we are off for the next two weeks. We will be back uh, for, a new, for a new episode January 7th. Uh, we will have bonus episodes shown throughout uh, the holidays. So at least you'll have those to look forward to because uh, this bunch of Canadian season as it is, not that much to look forward to with the bunch of Canadians. I know we're making jokes, but hey, this 2021 season, unlike anything, I mean, the calendar year, unlike anything any of us have ever experienced. Remember, they started off with the highs of the start to that year. There was a coach firing in the middle of it, a Stanley Cup final run all the way to the final against arguably the best team of the of the uh, the salary cup era in the uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning and and Mark Bergevin all these stories all these different things we were able to talk about on this great show and uh, for the fans watching who subscribe to the YouTube page and also to the Hockey Inside Out newsletter uh, we cannot thank you enough for supporting the show and we hope you do the same in 2022 so for everyone here on Hockey Inside Out I'm Julian McKenzie saying so long. Subscribe to the uh, YouTube page, of course. Subscribe to the Hockey Inside Out newsletter and check out HockeyInsideOut.com for full episodes. Uh, have a great holiday uh, and have a happy new year in advance. And we'll see you all in 2022.